Hello everybody, I'm celebrating America for tomorrow is the vote and I've been looking forward to this vote for the past several months. I can't wait to stroll into my alma mater, my high school that I graduated from way back in 1989 because it's at that high school that the vote takes place in my township. And uh, like I said, I've been waiting for months. This vote couldn't take place soon enough. Uh, but you know what? I've come to believe, and I've said this in other videos, and I think we should all caution ourselves, that the history of the world is not happening at random. The great sweeps of history are governed by the sovereignty of our God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. I'm not claiming that we are not sovereign over choices that we make day to day and stuff like that. Of course, we have free will, but I definitely believe that God is ultimately the sovereign of history. And no matter how we vote tomorrow, his will will be done. For in the book of Daniel, it says that God raises nations and God deposes nations. God raises kings and deposes kings. And yet, even though I believe that God is the sovereign of history, I still implore all of you or all of us who are American citizens to vote tomorrow to make your voice heard and known. Now, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for tomorrow. I pledged to myself and to you when I began the station uh, over a year ago uh, not to be sensational and not to enter into the political divisions in this country or any other country. It's not my job. My job is to update you about Israel, to teach you the Bible and what it has to say on the issue of Israel and the times that we live in. And for that reason, I try to maintain, at least officially, a political neutrality. Also, it would diminish my credibility as I weigh in on different issues. So just get out and vote tomorrow. And no matter how you vote tomorrow, just be aware that regardless of who wins tomorrow, both candidates, Trump and Harris, have communicated to Benjamin Netanyahu that they expect this present war to be concluded by the time either one of these guys or gals is inaugurated or their administration is inaugurated. Uh, what is it, around January 20th? That's usually when the inauguration takes place. This is where both candidates are very similar. Both of them, again, have communicated to Bibi that they expect this war to be finished by Inauguration Day in January, which means, folks, that you can expect a heck of a ride for the next three months. I predict, and I'm not basing this on the Bible or anything, I'm just going by my own intuition here, my own instincts, that the next three months are going to be incredibly action-packed. I think over these next three months, Israel is going to close its accounts with each of these parties. It's closed its account almost with Hezbollah, took out the leadership of Hezbollah, uh, and has wiped out something like 80% of Hezbollah's capacity to launch rockets and missiles at Israel, even though it still does each day, symbolically, okay, and it does cause damage. Killed several people a few days ago, killed seven people. But the war with Hezbollah is almost concluded. The war with Hamas is almost concluded. What account has yet to be closed, folks? The one with Iran and its regime. And boy, do I think that's going to be the locus and focus of Israel's attention over the next three months. I think over the next three months, we're going to see Israel attempt to take out Iran's nuclear capabilities and take out that country's economy and perhaps take out in the way it did with Hezbollah, that country's regime, including the Ayatollah. And why do I think this? And what are the signs of this happening over the next three months? Well, first of all, the first sign is what I just mentioned, that both candidates of the American presidential election have said that they expect this thing to be closed and finished off within the next three months. So Israel has no choice but to do it. It's not going to have the freedom to act after Inauguration Day uh, that it has now. For the next two to three months, Israel has the 
golden opportunity, an opportunity unparalleled, uh, unpresented up until now to take out Iran's nuclear capabilities. Number two, America has brought forth a fleet of B-52 bombers that are on their way to the Persian Gulf, and there's only one purpose for B-52 bombers in this scenario or in this theater of war, which is to take out Iran's nuclear program, which is deeply buried in the mountains, dispersed throughout that large country of Iran. These B-52 bombers have the capacity to drop 30,000 pound bunker busting bombs. Uh, something that Israel doesn't have. Israel doesn't possess these 30,000 pound bunker busting bombs, nor does it have the B-52 bombers that are required uh, to convey and drop these bombs. Israel only has in its own arsenal bombs that have 2,000 pounds of TNT in them. Uh, it used 80 such 2,000 pound bombs in succession and rapid fire to kill Hezbollah's leader Nasrallah, who was in a deeply buried bunker. But even then, would you believe Israel did not succeed to blow him up to bits? He died by suffocation. When they found Nasrallah's body, it was entirely intact. He had died of suffocation. In other words, 82,000 pound bombs were not able to blow him to bits and they were lucky to kill him in the fashion that they did. But for Iran's deeply buried nuclear program, it would require 30,000 pound bombs and it's doubtful that they could do the job entirely on their own. It may even require boots on the ground. Now, do I believe the United States is going to take out Iran's nuclear program? Well, I'm not sure it will. But by sending these B-52 bombers to the Persian Gulf, it's trying to convey to Iran via this body language that, be careful, Iran, don't tread too far on your threats to retaliate against America and Israel for Israel's last attack on Iran back on October 26, where you will be in danger of America taking out your nuclear program. Whether it does or doesn't do that is in question. Again, I'm not convinced that the United States would be willing to do this, but it may. Uh, in all events, Israel will try to take out Iran's nuclear program between tomorrow's election and Inauguration Day. Again, I'm not basing this on the Bible. I'm not claiming any prophetic inspiration. I never do that. Um, I'm just going on my intuition here that uh, th now's the time, and I think Israel's gonna go for it. In addition to taking out as much of Iran's regime as possible, especially if Iran carries through on its promise that it's been threatening the last few days to attack Israel in an attack that would surpass in intensity and severity its previous two attacks on Israel back in April and uh, October 1st. Now. You may ask, Steve, do you believe that this is Gog and Magog? It's so many people in the whole end time prophecy world and blogosphere and vlogosphere have been saying that this is for the last several years and especially since October 7th. Steve, do you agree that this is Gog and Magog? And the answer is simply no. And I'm going to give you four reasons why I believe that the chapters that deal with Gog and Magog and Ezekiel, they being chapters 38 and 39, tell us that this is not Gog and Magog. The first reason is that the chapters that deal with Gog and Magog and Ezekiel say that in that day, Israel will be an unwalled country. It will not be a country living behind walls, behind walls literally, behind walls of fear, metaphorically, because it will be a country that's living in peace. Gog and Magog suddenly takes place uh, at a time when the country is living in unprecedented peace, okay? Never in Israel's history has the country lived not behind walls. And for those of you who have been to Israel with me or with other people on tours, you notice that Israel is a country living behind 
walls and more walls, concentric walls, layers and layers of walls upon walls. So to claim that Israel today is an unwalled state or country, as is depicted in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, well, that's to me pretty far-fetched. Okay, so that's one major reason why I don't believe that this could be Gog and Magog in this round or at this time. The second reason is because in the chapters related to Gog and Magog, Israel is quoted as saying, have you come up to plunder us? Gog and Magog's motive for invading Israel, according to those two chapters of the Bible, is to plunder Israel. Well, uh, what's there to plunder in Israel today? Israel is not this wealthy nation such as the Arab Gulf nations are. Israel is not sitting on tons and tons of wealth. Yeah, it's true that the country's discovered over the past decade or so large reserves of natural gas. But again, this doesn't put Israel in the elite league of wealth as the Persian Gulf countries like the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, countries that are closer to Iran. So why would Iran travel across the Middle East to rob Israel of its wealth when it's got wealthier neighbors in its immediate vicinity? Which now leads to number three, why this can't be Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog is depicted as a land invasion of Israel. For this to happen, Iran would have to cross several countries, especially Jordan. It would have to cross the frontier of Jordan with Israel at the Dead Sea, for it's the Dead Sea that's called the Valley of Gog and Magog in those chapters. And today, the country of Jordan would not permit it. Jordan's monarchy is a firm ally of the United States, has a peace agreement with Israel, and in its current composition or its current form, there's no way that Iran would be admitted into Jordan. Uh, for that to happen, the present monarchy would have to be overthrown, and Jordan would have to become a inimical or hostile state to Israel governed by, let's say, as an example, the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? And that's just not currently the circumstances on the ground in Jordan. So that's the third reason why this can't be Gog and Magog at the present. The fourth reason why this can't be Gog and Magog at the present is because many people believe that Turkey is one of those countries in the Gog and Magog alliance and presently, Turkey is a member of NATO, which forbids it to join any such adventurism, okay? As long as Turkey is a member of NATO, it can't participate in such a Gog and Magog alliance and invasion of Israel. So I've given you four major reasons, in my opinion, why this is not Gog and Magog. Yes, I'll concede that uh, this is... Pr the prelims, okay, or the appetizers. You're seeing the characters take form and you're seeing uh, the stars beginning to align in what could be one day Gog and Magog, but is Gog and Magog about to unfold before our eyes at the present or over the next few months? No. When will Gog and Magog happen? Well, guess what? That's a subject that we're gonna cover in my series making sense of the end times, but this episode is not part of that series. So in closing, folks get out to vote tomorrow. If you're an American citizen, much blood has been poured for your right to vote tomorrow. And therefore it's our civic duty to honor the dead who died on distant battlefields, as well as our own continent to give us the right to vote, and I plan to exercise that right tomorrow, and so should you. And secondly, over the next three months, you're gonna see an uptick in the intensity in Israel's war with Iran, with Israel attempting to close accounts with that regime, to take out its nuclear program, as well as to take out that regime to the extent that it's possible. Whether or not America contributes to the cause or participates is an open question, but it's sending B-52s to the region is its way of communicating to Iran that that scenario 
of America participating in such a strike to take out Iran's nuclear program is in the cards is possible. At least that's the body language that America is communicating to Iran. And lastly, for reasons that I gave, this is not Gog and Magog, not yet. Israel is not unwalled. Israel is not sitting on a ton of wealth uh, that would draw Iran or anybody right now to cross the Middle East to, to pillage its wealth, especially since Iran has wealthier neighbors that border it, okay, rather than having to cross the Middle East a thousand miles to Israel on foot, which it can't do for reason number three, because Jordan's in the way, Jordan's monarchy, it's pro-American monarchy, which is in league with Israel, okay, wouldn't allow it. And lastly, Turkey, which is supposed to be one of the countries that most people believe at least participates in the whole Gog and Magog invasion, is currently not able to do so because of its membership in NATO. That's it, folks. That's a wrap. This is Steve, the tour guide, tipping my hat to you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.